Hello and welcome to the Grand Tour of Northumberland, section 24. On this section we'll be looking at some Romans, we're talking about smugglers and drovers and moonshiners <laughs> and lots of amazing Northumberland countryside. So join us for section 24. So you'd be wondering, why am I starting near Barrowburn? <laughs> just literally just over there. Well, it's because I'm doing it by myself today. <laughs> and in order to do it by myself, it means doing like an 18 and a half to 19 mile hike. So it's about six miles by road from here to the start of the next section, which is at Chew Green. That's where we left off last time and then we'll do the actual section itself. So first I've got a six mile road walk to do. Um, it's, it's a pleasant enough place to be walking, to be honest. It's, this road here is probably the rival to the last road in section 21 uh, for the best road in Northumberland, or well, most beautiful road in Northumberland, I should say. Okay, somewhere in this vicinity, I was hoping to see some masonry, but I'm not seeing any. I know it's near the old bridge. I'm not sure which side of the old bridge. Somewhere in this vicinity once stood the 13th century Barrowburn Fulling Mill. It was built by Cistercian monks from Newminster Abbey near Morpeth. The land was granted to the monks by the Umbravilles of Prudhoe. If you remember, we talked about the Umprevilles of Prudhoe on section one of the Grand Tour of Northumberland at Prudhoe Castle. It's likely that the mill was destroyed by Scots in the 14th century. Fulling is a process of making cloth, where the cloth is pounded to tighten the weave. They found some coins dating from Edward I that had been minted in Durham. Very cool place. This is Trowes Road End which was once the site of the notorious pub, the Slimefoot Inn. It was in famous as a den for moonshiners, smugglers, reavers and bandits. As you can see, the road's a very pleasant place to be. <laughs> Lots of little waterfalls and nice green rolling hills. So this area here is called Philip. And allegedly it was once the site of a 13th century battle where the Umprevilles of Prudhoe wiped out a raiding band of Scots. Today is one of the hottest days of the year. The sun's getting a bit relentless now. Must be getting close to midday, I think. So, umbrella up, provide some shade. So well, there's Chew Green, and we finished the last section and the true start of this section. <laughs> I'm going to take a short break there in order to put my walking poles on the bag. 
because I have to choose between poles or umbrella and in this sun, umbrella wins. <laughs> So that's a six mile walk to this point, which is the starting point of section 24 of the Grand Tour of Northumberland. If you wanted to take a shortcut, obviously you could take the road, which is six miles, as I just said, but we're gonna head up onto the border ridge and it's a 12 mile walk, 12 and a half mile walk back to the car. And we're headed in that direction. Not sure you're gonna get this on the camera, but this like a little wall and ditch. It's the outer wall of a massive Roman camp that you will see but from the air. Okay, here you might get a better idea of the structures. This here is a Roman fortlet. And these signs that you see dotted around the Cheviots. These signs that you see dotted around the Cheviots. These signs that you see dotted around the Cheviots. These signs that you see dotted around the Cheviots. These signs that you see dotted around the Cheviots are representative. Of I'm being trolled by a lamb. <laughs> These signs that you see. These signs that you see dotted around the Cheviots represent archaeological places. It's in order to make sure that the army doesn't dig them up. Welcome to Chew Green. This Roman complex is huge and it's best seen from the air. It's sometimes referred to as Ad Finis, which is Latin for on the border. But this was never on the border during Roman times. So that's not its Roman name. It's a name that's been added at a later date. What Chew Green's original name was during Roman times seems to have been lost to history. I have absolutely no idea what it is. The largest square marked on the ground is known as Camp One and is the earliest structure on the site and covers 19 acres. It was likely built around 79 to 80 AD as part of Angricola's first invasion of what now is Scotland. And the camp predates Hadrian's Wall. It was large enough to house an entire legion of four to six thousand soldiers. To the north is a rectangular structure called Camp 2 and this came after Camp 1. Although its state is unknown, it's 14 acres and large enough for a legion of at least four thousand men and likely part of the second invasion of what now is Scotland in 140 AD. Inside Camp 1 is a rhomboid shaped Roman fort that probably came shortly after Camp 1 to help protect workers building Deer Street. And Deer Street came down there and came along the edge of here and then turned around and up and around over there. The fort covered 6.5 acres which is larger than Housestead's 5 acres. As we know Housesteads housed around a thousand men, we could estimate a similar number of men for Chew Green. There were three fortlets built on the edge of Camp 1 that overlap each other and were built at different periods. All three were designed to protect Deer Street. The most prominent one, with three defensive ditches, was the last one built around 160 AD and abandoned around 190 AD. And this is where I'm stood at the moment, is in the last fortlet, the last one to be built on this side. And to be honest, probably the coolest one to come and see. As you can clearly see the defensive ditches. The Roman structures were probably built using turf mounds because there wasn't a great deal of other materials in the area. There were no trees here in those days and they had to use a special type of gate system in order to protect the forts because they didn't have enough wood in order to build a gate. So they used a, a special structure which limited the access to the fort and provided a bottleneck which was easy to defend. So we're following Deer Street at the moment. This goes along the side of the Roman fortlet. On the side of Deer Street and the Roman structures once lay a medieval village. A map of the site from the 18th century clearly indicate the remains of this village 
which in 1456 was known as Kemblepef, but by the end of 1550 was known as Kemblepef, which is where the name Camelpath comes from, from the previous section of Deer Street that we covered. In the vicinity where I'm stood now, once stood Chew Green Inn, and documents from as early as 1249 show that this was an important resting place for travellers and drovers, and it was also used as a place where they settled border disputes between England and Scotland. On satellite images, this area over here, you can see where pens were for the cattle from the drovers when they were staying the night at the Two Green Inn. Sadly, nothing much remains of it from the ground. It's a pity because if Neil had been here, can't pass a pub, Neil, he would have been in. <laughs> And the Lamp Hill next. I'll stop and have a bit of lunch. Mac and Don. Make, make and Don. Make and Don. It's down there. This is the farmhouse I passed when I was really walking along. So over there, that big one on the horizon there is the Cheviot. We'll be doing that eventually. At the moment, I'm on the slopes of Brown Heart Law. And just down here, in 1944, a Beaufort 1 torpedo bomber, serial number DX118, crashed into the side of Brown Heart Law, killing the pilot, William Milton. I don't think there's any wreckage of the plane left. I think they recovered the plane and took it down to the farm. Not only are we walking on Deer Street at the moment, but we're also walking on a section of the Pennine Way. Eventually the two will part separate ways, and we'll continue on the Pennine Way and leave Deer Street and the Romans behind. This is the site of a Roman signalling tower. Again, you can't really see much from the ground. If I provide a satellite image, you'll get to see it much more clearly. And it was used to warn Chew Green of any marauding picks. Just stop and take in the views, yeah. Very beautiful. Someone needs to tell the council in Rome to get some Romans out here and fix the road. It's fallen into disrepair. <laughs> to think that this used to be the main road between Scotland and England. This was the equivalent of your A1 or A68. Over there is a hut in the hill. That's a spotter's hut used by the military when they're doing exercises. This is all military land that we're on at the moment. Although this bit of land, they don't practice live firing. So this here is where the Fenway Way and Deer Street depart. Deer Street headed that way somewhere. section of Deer Street from Toford to the border is scheduled ancient monument and as such is protected under the Ancient Monument and Archaeological Areas Acts 1979. It is a bridal way in terms of the Countryside Scotland Act 1967 only and there is no access to motorised vehicles. I'm glad they've marked where it is. I wouldn't have never have got it. <laughs> So we'll leave the Romans behind on their fancy Roman roads and head on the Pennine Way with its paving in areas but bog traps as well. <laughs> That's there uh, looking into Scotland. Fence here is the border between England and Scotland. We've come over there. Magnificent views here. Really beautiful.
360 degrees. How beautiful is that? I'm going to put pavement stones down to help you get past the bog. <laughs> the pavement stones sink into the bog. The small cairn there, I'm not exactly sure why. Possibly to keep you on the right road. It's, it does get a bit confusing when you're crossing over there because you've moved away from the border fence, which is over there. It's like a shortcut off the corner. I thought it was a dead sheep, but it was just sleeping. <laughs> okay, there's some young goats just on the other side of here. It's a small herd of them. Could stand there all day watching them. I've got a long way to go, so I can't. Over there is another army spotter hut, which means I'm quite close to where I'm going to stop for lunch. There's views into Scotland, the Elden Hills are over there. Beautiful. That hill there. I've been watching all the way. It looks like a man-made pyramid stuck on the side of a hill. It's been grassed over. It's a very interesting place. I might have to come back one day and have a look. There's an old building down the bottom there. An old a farmhouse or something. We've come around like that on this side. There's the army spot I put down there. Achieve it on the horizon. That's an old boundary stone. Burning Saddle, Lamb Hill, Mountain Refuge Hut. Ah. And that's inside. Not luxury accommodation, but it'll get you out of trouble. Okay, there's the book. I've walked across Great Glen Way, then down to West Highland Way, and now down the Pennine Way once again. It's wonderful to reach this lovely hut once again. So, before I eat my lunch, I'll be late at lunch because it's near two o'clock now, uh, there's a couple of border legends for here. <laughs> on the hereabouts. Down Blind Bird, there used to be an illicit whiskey still owned by Black Rory. It was one of many that he owned in the Cheviot Hills. And it was so well concealed that the excise men passed it four times and failed to see it. Hence the reason Blind Burn. 
However, they probably didn't see it because they were blind drunk on whiskey that they've been bribed with. I never tell for these pots lies over there, a place called Yearning Hall. It's a place that Donna Vancini actually visited. I'll put a link below. So the story goes that there was once a drainer lived in the Cheviot Hills. And his job was to help drain the land to make it more suitable for sheep. Big no-no these days, because we want to preserve the peat bogs. Now, the master of Yearning Hall had a brother. His brother had moved down south, got married, and was doing quite well for himself, became quite wealthy. Well, the other brother stayed at Yearning Hall in the middle of the Cheviots. Okay, I was going to sit outside and have my lunch, but it suddenly became midgy hell. So I'm going to tell this story while on the move, because a lot of midges at the hut. They must be able to smell blood from 50 miles away because I don't know where they've come from. One day there was a knock at the door and the brother went to answer it and there was a baby with a letter saying that his mother had died. His father had died shortly afterwards with heartbreak and the locket showed proof of the baby's identity that the baby was indeed his nephew. Now the brother was quite poor and the last thing he wanted was another mouth to feed. However, the baby came with a large inheritance, all the wealth that the other brother had managed to accumulate. Being quite poor and with large gambling debts, my brother saw an opportunity. If he could just get rid of the baby, he could claim the inheritance for himself, pay off his debts and live quite comfortably. Look at that view. Amazing, that? So one night, I came and knocked at the door again. <laughs> this time it was a traveller, one of the travelling folk of uh, Kurt Yetum. And he was looking to make a little bit of coin with any odd jobs and stuff. So the brother said, okay, I'll give you this baby, get rid of it for me, I'll give you a large sum of money. Produced a pocket full of notes. It was more money than the traveller had ever seen. So the traveller said, all right, yeah, sure, I'll get rid of the baby. What do you want me to do with it? And brother said, go out and drown it in one of those peat bogs on the hills. So the traveller took the baby and off he went with the money in his pocket. And when he got to one of the peat bogs, he couldn't bring himself to throw the baby into it. And he looked around and there he saw the drainer. So the drainer offered to take the baby on for a minimum sum of money, of course. Took him home and raised him as his own son. So the boy grew up, and went into the family trade with his stepfather of training the Cheviots. Only he had fallen in love with the daughter of the hall, and not realising that it was actually his cousin. After they'd been courting for a while, the daughter went to her father and said that she was going to get married to the son of the drainer. Her father went off it, went absolutely livid, said that there's no way that his daughter was going to marry the son of a drainer. It wasn't going to happen. So the daughter was really distressed. She ran off into the hills crying. So when the drainer found out, he went off it. What? His daughter's not good enough for my son. So he went off to the hall full of hell. So when he got to the hall, he demanded that his son was going to marry the daughter. Obviously the father said, no way, not a chance in hell. So the drainer said, look, he says, I know your secret. He says, here's a locket that was found on a baby that you tried to murder in the peat bog and that baby is your nephew and that nephew I've raised as my son and he's going to marry your daughter and get into his rightful inheritance whether you like it or not. After the drainer had threatened to tell the authorities about the attempted murder, the, his stepson and the daughter of the hall ended up getting married and lived happily ever after at the hall and guess what? So did the drainer, spent the rest of his days living at the hall. Quick stop and look back. There used to be loads of settlements around here. Bronze Age and Medieval. The place used to be teeming with people, but they all disappeared. I don't know whether they were cleared for sheep, like they were in the highlands, or whether it was just lack of opportunities or all the violence from the border rivers that made them go away. So this is the top of Lambs Hill. 
it's not a significant top so there's no point in crossing the fence in order to bag it not unless you're busy collecting ordnance survey trig points and we're heading up this one next which is beef stand hill eventually we're going over to that one over there which is windy guile camera does not do this justice at all really need to be here to see this okay this is the top of beef stand hill this is a significant top it's called a dewey which means that it's between 500 and 610 meters with a prominence of at least 30 meters and just have a look at the views that's looking into Scotland over there That's the border ridge. That's Windy Guile over there, which is where we're going next. The car's parked over in that direction. And that's looking back the way we just came. Pretty magnificent here like but again the camera will just not do it justice you really need to come here and see it for yourselves let's just stop to take in this view those are the first two people I've seen since Chew Green over there it's done in views down the bottom there's quite a significant dam Just come down from there, which is Beef Stand Hill. So, this is the top of Mozzie Law. It has a marker, although it's not a significant top, but it'll give you an idea where I am on the map if you're busy following me on my route. Again, amazing views. Beef Stand Hill over there. isn't Scotland see the Elden Hills really clearly from here but you won't on the camera there's the Cheviot that's Windy Guy which we're doing next three hundred and sixty degrees of magnificence it's beautiful here really is There was a little vole on the path. I don't know if I caught it on camera or not. It was very cute. This here is the street. This is one of Mick's favorite walks. He did it with the belated Wilco. I'll put a link below to it. Uh, his channel's Blamhoff. Another person worth checking out if you're interested in walks in Northumberland and Scotland as well. The street's an ancient drover's road and sometimes mistaken as a Roman road because of its name but it's unlikely the Romans built the road so close to Deer Street plus I haven't found any Roman remains along this road. However there are numerous old Bronze Age forts on either side of the street and the street appears to have ended at the hill fort called Houndham Rings Fort and there are standing stones at that fort as well. So we have a good idea that the street was probably pre-Roman and dates from the Bronze Age linking up the hill forts that were in the area. It was later used by drovers and smugglers of whiskey and salt and it was once known as the clattering path. So I'm heading up to Windy Gow which is one and a half miles in that direction where all those people are coming from. That's the most people I've ever seen together in the Cheviots. It's a miracle. That's the strangest thing ever. That's what tribe of people 
four people and a dog walking towards us. I could hear them clearly. Now I can't even hear them, I can't see them, they've just vanished. I honestly don't know where they've gone. They've just disappeared. That's oh, weird that like. <laughs> Since it chills up your spine. That's seriously weird that like I'm quite freaked out to be honest. There's four of them and the dog. They were making a lot of noise. They were walking slowly towards me. I went into a little dip, I came up the dip and they were gone. Vanished. No sound of them. Can't hear them or anything, can't see them. I should have passed them by now. That's just weird. Obviously that's just really, really weird. They couldn't have got onto the street without passing me first. So either way, if we were going to Scotland or England, it made no difference, they had to pass me to get there. And they just disappeared. There's no sign of them. At all. And they were making a lot of noise. You could really hear them. And then they just vanished. Like, they just went silent and they weren't there. I want to check the camera to make sure I'm not seeing things. I definitely filmed them. So, if they really were there, I'll see them on the camera. I hope I'm not hallucinating. That'd be quite weird. Wow. That's strange, so, so, so strange. I'm, I'm quite spooked about it, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, they did seem out of place. They, they looked as though they were having a picnic or something when I was busy changing the battery on the camera. And then they got up to move and then they were walking towards me. And then they just disappeared. See, like here, I'm now on a brow so I can see into Scotland in case I jumped the fence and went that way across the rough ground. There's nothing, there's nobody there. Oops. So there's nobody in Scotland, there's definitely nobody in England. I'm definitely here by myself. So where the hell did they go? See, there's a clearer view into Scotland, not a sign of them. Beautiful place, though. Really beautiful. I mean, if it just disappeared out of sight, then fair enough. You know, uh, when I went into that little dip, I would have just assumed they jumped over the fence and I must have missed them when they were into Scotland. But they were making a lot of noise and the sound just disappeared. That, that, that's the thing. That's the really weird thing. Even if I had jumped the fence, I would have still heard them. So we just come. This huge scar on the landscape. It's beautiful. And we're heading up there to Windy Gale. Now I saw two hikers descending. Hopefully they'll pass me this time and not just disappear. So those lads were definitely real. <laughs> They're doing the Pennine way by the looks of it. They had very heavy packs on. But they're going to be looking to settle down for the night soon. There's another two hikers on their way down. It's quite busy today. Not usually this busy in the GVT. Some sheep want to get on camera. So that was a nice couple from near Jedbra. And they're heading to Cocklowfoot Farm which is down there. Used to be an old drover's route if I came along this way. I'm probably headed down this pass, probably. Now it's called Maiden Cross. It's kind of lost on record. No one knows exactly where it went. But kind of, it was on this side of Windy Gile. Slightly, it came down this way. There's a little bit of a scar on the landscape. And then came down, and then dropped down there. And then went slightly there, and then there's a bit of scar down there as well. A 
likely it went that way, but we can't be for sure. Oh wow, just looking back the way I came. Amazing. Beautiful. Wendy Guile everybody, this is the sixth highest top in Northumberland. Really good views from up here, which I'll show you in a minute. There's the Cheviot, Coombe Fell, Hedgehog Hill, and Dunmore Hill behind it. Blowing a gale. Lift up to its name this place, Windy. The windy part of Windy Gale obviously is because it's nearly always windy here. It lives up to its name. Uh, in fact, a lot of the time it's under cloud, but the last couple of times it's been quite clear, it's been good. Um, the gale bit, however, comes from the word gowl, which means a pass between the hills. And it's likely a reference to the old Drovers Road, Maiden Cross, uh, as is pointed out as we're walking up. Was probably on that side of the hill. This cairn is known as Russell's Cairn and refers to Lord Francis Russell who was murdered here by the Scots in 1585. The border area was split into marches and disputes were settled under a flag of truce by the March Wardens. Lord Francis Russell was one of those wardens and he came to Windy Gyle to settle such a dispute. It's unsure what the border dispute was that brought Lord Russell here but they obviously broke out in violence and it ended up in his death. However, there was a noted Scottish raid on Shill Moor in the 16th century where 200 Armstrongs, Elliots and Croziers stole 100 cattle, 20 horses and took 20 men prisoners for ransom. I'm unable to confirm the exact date, but it could be a possibility that Lord Russell was here to negotiate the release of the hostages. But well, obviously we don't know that for certain. So we're leaving the summit of Windy Gyle and we're also leaving the Pennine Way. We are going to head this way into the Coquet Valley. It's two and three quarter miles. It's probably going to be a little bit further than that to be honest because we're going on a slightly different route. There's a look back at the sides of the cairn. As you can see it's quite a substantial cairn and its prominent position would probably mean that somebody important was buried here. Well, likely because of the size of the cairn, it was an important family. There was probably more than one person buried there. So in this vicinity here, once stood a standing stone. Sadly, there's no sign of it. The stone was called Split the Deal and is still marked on maps today. Although the place has kind of changed. It was actually behind where I am now. Split the Deal is Old Scots for Split the Devil. Now, there's a chance, and this is just a chance, that the actual stone was part of the cross that used to be here called Maiden Cross. The Maiden Cross Drovers Road was marked by a cross called the Maiden Cross and the chances are that something happened to the cross that split it and destroyed it leaving only the base of it and that was the standing stone that got nicknamed Split the Deal, Split the Devil, like the devil split the cross. Now. How much truth is in that, I don't know. But there was definitely a cross here once upon a time and there was definitely a standing stone called Split the Deal. Whether the two were the same or not is my personal guess. One thing that we do know, however, is that the standing stone was not an ancient standing stone. It was more of the medieval period. I know that that path there goes to Trow's Road End, which I don't want. I know I have to take this path and I know I go across there and then I go over across Barrow Law. But you can see Middle Hill there and Barrow Law is on the other side of Middle Hill. So it's like you're going in the wrong direction to get to the right place. <laughs> so it gets really confusing because like you know the hills. So you, you know that one over there is Yards Path Law. You know that there is Bloody Bush Edge. You know that this is Usbury Ford Forest. So you're walking in the wrong direction 
but it takes you to the place where you want to be, which is actually over there. But the path that goes in that direction takes you to the wrong place. <laughs> Very confusing. <laughs> so that's looking back at Windy Gale. I'm gonna skirt the edge of this hill over here, which is called Ward Law. Law is old Northumbrian for hill. Eventually we're gonna go over Barrow Law, which will then take us back to the car at Barrow Bin. Oh dear, <laughs> just walked into a herd of cattle. Hopefully they'll be all right. And this is the Cheviots, and sometimes they're not. I'll give them a wide berth. We're heading down there any case. Good, for a change. These ones are minding their own business. They can be a bit dodgy in the Cheviots. You know, watch yourself. Path gets a little wild at the end, but it's not too bad. And we're at where we needed to be. As I said, that path, it always seems as though you're going in the wrong direction, but it leads you to where you need to be at the end. <laughs> the public bridle way. That's going to take us back to the car. So this is the reason why we came here. This place is called Murder Cloth because of this. Says Murder Cloth. Here in 1610, Robert Lumsden killed Isabel Sutton. Robert Lumsden was a local landowner who had a liking for married women. Upon finding out that Isabella Sutton was pregnant with his illegitimate child, he stoned her to death. He was eventually caught in Anik and sentenced only to one month in jail for the crime. And that murder gave this place its name. As you cross in Barrowlaw, you come across this strange stone structure. When I first saw it, I thought that it was maybe a field ditch or a field drain. But then if you look across there, it continues quite far and therefore was it a field boundary? Quite a good possibility, could be a field boundary. And over there on that knoll there, they've got a Bronze Age settlement. So I has me wondering whether these stones are Bronze Age or not simply don't know to be honest. I've put it out there to ask, no answers. No one knows. That's looking down at Barrowbend. I'm parked just behind those trees down there. It's a stunning place, beautiful. This hill Shilmoor. It's the first hill I ever took my daughter up. How lush is that? Beautiful. I said they're moving the cattle up here into this field. I'll just wait here for them. These look like the young bullocks I saw this morning. And trials rolled in. That's the end of section 24 of the Grand Tour of Northumberland. How did I find that? Um, it was quite good. I was surprised about how much history there was. Obviously you can't really see the history so much. It's more just the tales that go with the landscape. But the landscape was absolutely amazing. Trouble is now I'm starting to be eaten by midges, <laughs> which were a bit of a problem. Even with the wind, there's still a bit of a problem. So I'm gonna make this really quick. Um, yeah, I found it very good. Um, I was doing all right until the last mile or so over Barrow Low, and then I started really feeling a bit tired. I was going to do a wild camp today. I've got all my camping gear in the back of the car, 
I was going to head back to Tube Green and then head into the hills again and do a wild camp, but I'm really feeling tired. I, I honestly don't feel that I would enjoy it, um, so I'm not going to do it. Plus, as I said, the midges are out. Um, there's, the wind seems to have died a little bit and it's starting to get a little bit cloudy as well, so and a little bit lit. So I'm going to wrap this up really quickly because I'm getting eaten alive. So if you like the video, give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to leave a comment below. Hit the subscribe button for the next adventure. Share with your friends on social media and I'll catch you on the next one.